commemorates the 70th anniversary of the war to resist U.S. aggression and aid Korea. The war broke out 70 years ago, and the peninsula remains divided to this day, at times confrontational, and with the threat of a Cold War mentality rising. So, how is China commemorating the war and its involvement in it? What roles are China and the U.S. now playing on the Korean peninsula? And what lessons are still being learned from the conflict? To discuss these issues and more, I'm joined by Dr. Zhao Hai, research fellow from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Sun Yun Lee, a Kim Ku Korea Foundation professor of Korean studies at the Fletcher School of Tufts University, and author Robert Kelly, professor in the Department of Political Science at Pusan National University. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Wang Mengmang. Uh, welcome to all of you to our program. So memory of this war has been complex with each nation having its own narrative and perspective on the war. And here in China, a series of events have been held over the past few days to mark this occasion. President Xi Jinping also delivered a speech this morning to commemorate this event. So let's talk about this. What is China remembering 70 years on after the war? Let's begin with Dr. Zhao Hai here. Yeah, I think uh, this is very important because President Xi made it clear that China remembers a fallen man and woman over 70 years ago in Korea, and uh, China still remembers their spirit of resisting the U.S. aggression and helping and aid uh, Korea. So I think even, even today, uh, this event is still very meaningful uh, to current U.S.-China relations and China's development in the future. And secondly, I think in Xi's speech, he made it very clear that China will play a responsible uh, uh, role in the world, and China upholds the uh, common humanity, common values, and in the future, China will strive to uphold peace and development uh, in the region and around the world. So China will continue to play a very key role in the world, maintaining peace uh, and helping others when needed, and also fighting back anywhere that there's injustice, unfairness, and imperial, imperialism aggression. And now let's get some perspective uh, from South Korea. Professor Lee, what are your takes from uh, President Xi's speech this morning? Well, of course, this is a great historical war for China, for North Korea, for South Korea, for the United States and 15 other nations that sent troops into the theater under the banner of the United Nations. For China, the Korean War is simply the biggest war. It is the only war in which all of China's armed forces, Marine, air, ground troops participated. It is the only war that China fought in an extended, prolonged war against a superpower. It is the only war from which Chinese troops retreated in the end. So China came out of the war with greatly enhanced international prestige. And the Chinese commander, Peng Dohuai, said in September 1953, gone forever is the time when Western nations could conquer an East Asian country simply by mounting cannons along the coast. So it is a great historical war for the Chinese people. And the Chinese People's um, Volunteer Army fought really hard in the war. They knew they were going to face a much stronger force. And, of course, the two sides are mismatched in terms of their equipment, weapons, supplies, and logistics. Now, Dr. Zhao, what do you think led to the final victory in this war? Well, President Xi said in his speech that uh, when Chinese people are organized, uh, they're unconquerable and they will achieve the final victory. Uh, I think that's the lesson we learned from that war, and it's very clear compared to the so-called 100 years of humiliation in Chinese history. What happened before the Korean War is that uh, when Chinese are divided fighting each other, they cannot afford to fight a foreign invasion power, let alone resisting the, most, uh, in, uh, the, the biggest country, the superpower in the world. So when even under the circumstances when the Chinese army has no superior weaponry, However, when they're organized and supported by the Chinese people, they can still win the war and still, uh, in comparison, uh, to resist the, the uh, most important and most powerful country in the world, even with the firepower of the United States, the Chinese people are not in fear and can still uh, continue to fight the war until the end to reach the truth. And uh, that's the first war, I think, uh, in modern history that the U.S. has not achieved complete uh, victory. 
And I think on the Chinese side, uh, just uh, uh, the other speaker has uh, told, told us that China after that had enhanced its international standing and also uh, solidified, uh, I think, in 20 years, uh, the uh, standing uh, committee member in the, in the United Nations uh, Security Council. So I think China will continue to play this responsible role and will continue to resist any pressure, let alone uh, uh, you know, any uh, uh, extreme pressure or any bullyism around the world. Well, the CPV soldiers fought against all odds and at all price. So let me get your take on this, uh, Professor Kelly. What is your major takeaway from President Xi Jinping's speech this morning? Sure, I, I think two sort of things. First, the Korean War is often sort of forgotten in history, right? In part because it ended as a stalemate. Um, the war still hasn't really resolved. There's no sort of clear sense of who the winner was, right? It's not really correct that China won the war. It's not correct that the Americans won the war. I mean, everyone tells sort of a narrative about this, but it essentially ended in a stalemate where the lines were where they began. And so I think you get sort of a sense that on all sides, that you, just sort of, you need to rehearse a kind of nationalist narrative to justify why a war was fought with so many casualties that really ended in no strategic decision at all. And I think that's really sort of the primary driver. You see this in the United States, too, where there's sort of discussions about the Korean War and sort of the heroism of it and the rest of it, even though, as was pointed out by your other guests, it was the first time the United States actually lost a major conflict. I think the other big issue is that China wants to continue to assert a role, a relevance, in Korea, if there's any kind of final solution in Korea, which has been sort of discussed in the last couple of years with Donald Trump, if there's any final resolution of Korean issues, whether nuclear or otherwise, China wants to have a say. And so by trumpeting China's role in the war, that reiterates China's importance as some kind of arbiter in any kind of final Korean resolution. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, different nations are having very different uh, memory and perspective, their narratives about this war. Why do you think that's the case, Professor Lee? Well, um, because of the ambiguity under which the war ended, it creates problems in terms of historical memory. Um, in the United States, as Professor Kelly mentioned, the war has long been dubbed the Forgotten War. It's an uneasy memory for the American people because, yes, it is the first war in which the United States did not prevail over its adversary. And then it came to be eclipsed by even arguably a more controversial war in the 1960s, the Vietnam War, which led to major soul-searching and skepticism when it came to believing the government. At the same time, you know, it's a historical fact that China has not fought a war in 40 years, over 40 years, since 1979. It's also a historical fact that Taiwan, South Korea, North Korea have not fought a major war uh, in the theater, in the region, since the armistice of 1953. So we have 70 years of de facto peace since the, the shooting stopped in 1953. Whereas if you look at the 60-year period leading up to the outbreak of the war, the region, the Korean Peninsula, and Manchuria have been engulfed in four major wars since 1894. So over the past 70 years, much good and prosperity and development have been experienced by the people in the region. Mm -hmm. And this war is known in the West as the Forgotten War, as you mentioned, Professor Lee, being overshadowed by uh, the more recent memories of World War II, uh, the Vietnam War, and also the more recent conflicts in the Middle East. Now, I want to get your thoughts on this, Dr. Zhao. Why is it being seen as an unforgotten war here in China? What are the legacies that we are still commemorating today, 70 years after the war? Well, first of all, the war is not uh, forgotten. It's actually uh, some uh, American elites choose to forget it uh, because the war is not uh, a, a victory, I think, in American history. And that's a humiliation. For the Chinese people, it's um, commemorated because uh, under such a, a dire situation when China has no uh, uh, you know, major weapons to speak of and uh, in, in the battlefield in such an inferior inferior state uh, without uh, air cover, without uh, heavy artillery. Still, Chinese people, uh, depending on the spirit and uh, you know, people's support, uh, China achieved its strategic goal, which is to repel uh, U.S. aggression. So I think overall, even though uh, the ending is a truce, but I think China is still the, uh, you can still say that China is a winner in this because China achieved the, the goal that uh, it start, uh, set out to be. 
So I think at the end of the day, we remember this war is to actually uh, continue to pursue peace in the region in the future. And I think this is a reminder to uh, every party involved in that war that in order to maintain peace, it's very important to remember the lesson uh, of, the, of the Korean War, that no outside country should impose their will to uh, the Korean people or, in that case, to the Vietnam people or to uh, the Chinese people. So I think at the end of the day, the, the uh, Asian people sh should have their saying uh, to their um, internal affairs and to maintain you know, the integrity of their territory and also defend their, their, their sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So overall speaking, that's my take uh, of today's Xi speech. Yeah, since you mentioned this, Dr. Zhao, in his speech, President Xi said that the success of resistance in the war showed China's firm resolution to safeguard world peace. Let's have a listen to this. Bearing in mind the great victory and promoting the great cause, we must maintain world peace and justice and promote the building of a community with a shared future for mankind. The Chinese nation has always adhered to the concept of being friendly and kind to neighbors. As a responsible major nation, China sticks to the common values of peace, growth, fairness, justice, democracy, and freedom, and adheres to the concept of global governance based on communication, joint contribution, and shared benefits. We will unswervingly follow the path of development based on peaceful, open, cooperative, and shared concepts. Well, as we just heard, President Xi Jinping reiterated China's stance to maintain world peace and justice. But let me ask you this, uh, Professor Kelly, why why do you think that China is still being portrayed sometimes as an aggressive power? What is your take on the different images and understandings of Chinese intentions? Sure, I think the likelihood of a serious spiral between the United States and China is fairly high actually in the next couple of decades. And I think the, the core issue is domestic regime type, which is to say that the United States and its Western allies are liberal democracies and China is not, that's bound to sow mistrust um, we'll be able to sort of strike trees and, and join international organizations and work together on issues like the North Korean nuclear program or climate change. But I don't think there'll be anything like a war and peace as long as you have a dramatic dispersion, a, a dramatic difference between the regimes at home. Um, that's sort of the first issue. I think the second issue in terms of China's, uh, China's reputation, China's sort of prestige in the world depends on how China treats its Pacific Rim neighbors. That specifically means Taiwan, Hong Kong, South China Sea, and North Korea. Um, if China comes off with a cooperative on these things in the next decade or so, the relationships will be easier. If it does not, it will not. And right now under Xi Jinping, there's sort of been a turn towards more hawkish nationalism. I think that's, uh, that's sort of driving the, uh, the hawkish discussion in the West. Your thoughts on this, Professor Lee? Well, China's capabilities today are uh, incomparable, cannot be compared with China's capabilities in the 1950s. That in itself inherently presents a threat, the f perception of threat to the United States and to the smaller powers in the region. That's a reality. From China's point of view, however, uh, the Korean War was a matter of existential survival. It was not to the United States or to the Western powers or to Australia or New Zealand or Thailand or the Philippines uh, or other nations that sent troops. It was a war of survival for South Korea and North Korea and in Chinese eyes to China itself because China felt encircled by the United States in Indochina as the U.S. It vastly increased um, underwriting the bill for the French uh, colonial powers in Indochina as the U.S. recommitted itself to the defense of Taiwan. So in effect, uh, the liberation of Taiwan, that plan had to be shelved uh, for the Chinese Communist Party in 1950. So China lost some from the outcome of the war, but gained a lot more, I would say. And uh, the long-term effect of that is China is now a power to be reckoned with, second only to the United States. Well, Dr. Zhao, how would you respond to uh, the other scholars describing China's rise as being perceived by the U.S. as a threat? Because some observers say that China is filling the void left by the U.S. Well, one of the things I noticed is that uh, the U.S. side continued to not recognize China's sovereignty. 
uh, in this issue. For instance, uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan, they're, uh, they're not our neighbors, they're our countrymen, they're our brothers and sisters, not like Korea people. So I think there's a, a fundamental and significant difference here. And in terms of the aggressiveness, because the U.S. continued to interfere into uh, China's uh, sovereignty and uh, preventing China to achieve uh, territorial integrity, and that's why uh, they feel somehow when China insisting on its uh, integrity and sovereignty, it's a threat to the U.S. national security. That's a misperception. So I think at the end of the day, the U.S. should realize and should follow it, actually, adhere to the U.N. Uh, uh, charter and uh, you know follow this uh, notion, this collective security notion, instead of building alliances, particularly military alliances, to encircle China and try to uh, you know uh, uh, continue to um, uphold their own hegemony in the region to, to try to maintain that that hegemony. So overall, I think it's very important that in this region, all the countries are participating in a complete, comprehensive uh, framework that every member in this should contribute to the peace of the region. Instead of dividing different countries uh, into different groups and uh, making them against each other based on ideological differences. I think there are fundamental differences in terms of regime type, I agree. However, that shouldn't be a case that uh, you know, uh, divide p uh, the different peoples and different countries and societies, making them uh, you know, fighting against each other, being adversaries uh, between the, uh, the two countries or different kind of societies. I think that's the notion China is trying to promote. Yeah, and Professor Kelly mentioned a moment ago that the, this war never ended. Um, it ended with an armistice deal. Now, is there a strong demand to replace the current armistice deal with a, with a peace system? And what are the conditions for that to happen? Would, would you like me to answer that? Professor Kelly, please. Yes, okay, sorry. Um, I, the North Koreans very much would like a peace deal, right? A peace deal would legitimize the existence of North Korea as a legitimate, real Korean state alternative to South Korea, right? The inter-Korean race is effectively over, and North Korea has lost it in the same way that East Germany lost the inter-German race during the Cold War, right? You know, South Korea is larger, wealthier, healthier, um, better governed and so on than, than North Korea, right? And, and North Korea sort of remains a sort of bizarre Orwellian sort of throwback to, to the Cold War, right? And so North Korea desperately wants a peace treaty, it desperately wants formal relations and any kind of like formal interaction with the rest of the world, membership in the IMF and things like that, in order to sort of justify North Korea's existence as a state at all, right? Um, in South Korea, there's much more reticence on, there's more, much more reticence on this, in part because signing some kind of end of the war resolution with North Korea wouldn't, in fact, actually really change very much on the ground. No one actually trusts North Korea. So if South Korea actually signed this, it wouldn't actually lead to a retrenchment of the U.S., for example, from South Korea. It wouldn't lead to a shrinkage of the South Korean military or changes in sort of the way the South Korean Air Force is structured or something like that. So we can sign, I mean, the, South Korean, the current South Korean government has been talking about this for several years. We can sign an end of the war resolution or a peace treaty or something like that, but it doesn't actually bring peace. Peace on the peninsula is still basically guaranteed by Deterrence, again, because a regime type, which is to say that South Korea and North Korea are even further apart than the United States and China. So, so there's no real peace without the, the current military standoff, without deterrence. And Professor Kelly, this war is essentially a, a hot war during a Cold War era. And when the two superpowers, the U.S. and the Soviet, Soviet Union, competed for um, supremacy, to what degree do you think we are facing another Cold War, and how is it different this time? Yeah, I'm actually quite afraid that we're going to slide into a Cold War pretty soon, the United States and, and Japan on the one side and, and China on the other. Um, I, I still think that that can be averted. Um, I do think that leadership, sort of like really committed leadership, can actually like, improve this. Um, Donald Trump is pretty obviously not capable of that. Um, he's too sort of focused on himself and, and doesn't really understand international relations. We'll probably have a new president in about three months. I think there's the possibility of sort of symmetry that could sort of at least smooth things over a little bit, maybe sort of help find some kind of deal, for example, on North Korea's nuclear weapons or, or rules for the South China Sea, rules of the road for the South China Sea. But, um, but again, I, you know, China's rising rapidly, and, and China's still basically a Leninist one-party state, and the United States is a liberal democracy. It's very, very hard to see the two of them not colliding. I mean, I suppose it's possible that China's neighbors could sort of draw separate pieces with, with China, India, and Japan being the most important ones, but... But as long as China's neighbors are all sort of sketchy and, and, and hedging on Chinese power, 
that means Vietnam, the Philippines, South Korea, Japan, most most importantly. Uh, you're, you're looking, I would argue, I would say you're looking at a pretty good likelihood of a, of a Cold War repeat, unfortunately. All right. Thank you so much for your analysis, uh, Professor Robert Kelly, Department of Political Sciences from Pusan National University. Thank you for your insights. So, uh, gentlemen, let's keep talking about the Cold War. Uh, President Xi Jinping raised the concept of the Cold War in his speech this morning. Um, and what, what is his and China's view on a potential new Cold War? Dr. Jeff. Well, uh, in the past three years, we've seen uh, U.S.-China relations deteriorating from uh, first a trade war, then a great power struggle a competition. And then uh, in recent months, there's this constant mentioning of a new Cold War or Cold War 2.0. Uh, first of all, I don't think China wants a Cold War, and I, I don't think American people wants a Cold War. I don't think any other country around the world would like to see another Cold War, because the Cold War is still just 30 years ago, ended 30 years ago, and uh, a lot of people still have uh, bad memories about it. Uh, if the world will revert back to that situation, uh, divided into different camps and competing with, e with each other, and also bring the world to the brink of nuclear war, uh, that's nobody in nobody's interest. So I think at the end of the day, what China is trying to promote is that uh, you know, each country and uh, you know, countries should, around the world should uh, you know, combine their forces trying to maintain peace and uh, further their development. There are still a lot of countries around the Belt and Road Initiative uh, uh, still you know, in, in poverty and trying to get themselves uh, to a higher living standard. Many people are still trying to uh, or uh, in pursuit of peace. There are still many regions around the world in war or instability. So I think that's the real uh, uh, people's real desire, not a, a renewed Cold War. Uh, I think uh, if that's the majority will around the world, a, a handful of people in the United States or in power right now trying to promote this new Cold War or decoupling between the U.S. and China cannot achieve their goal because ultimately uh, no support will come about uh, to support their agenda. Uh, let me get your perspective on this, uh, Professor Lee. What are the chances that... Um we are going to slid into another Cold War because, as Professor Kelly just mentioned, China and the U.S. are having an increasingly difficult situation over the years, and uh, chances are that w we are likely to face a new Cold War. Well, in the wake of China's dramatic rise over the past three decades, I would say from about 20 years ago, apprehensions of the revival of the Cold War, a war possibly between the United States and China, have existed. Um, that perception is still there, and it's been exacerbated, yes, um, in recent years by rhetoric and by actions on both sides. But I would say the party in this, the nation most infected or even inspired by the so-called Cold War mentality, is really North Korea. North Korea's nuclear threat capabilities to the region and to the continental United States is real now. North Korea has become a credible nuclear threat to the U.S. mainland and shows no sign of denuclearization. In fact, since the summit, first summit meeting between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un more than two years ago in Singapore, North Korea has vastly advanced uh, its nuclear and missile capabilities. So North Korea is the factor, the most likely pot potential factor in triggering uh, another hot war or accentuating, exacerbating the emerging Cold War. Well, this featured briefly in um, the presidential debate, the final presidential debate today, where um, Donald Trump and Joe Biden exchanged their views on the relationship between the DPRK and the United States and also denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. So looking back, though, um, the, the, the scars of the war has, have been so serious that it took 20 years for... China and the United States to talk again, and it took another 20 years for China and South Korea to normalize their relations. Uh, however, we are still seeing splits on the Korean Peninsula and also uh, divisions between uh, the DPRK and the U.S. So what is the present-day relevance of this war to the relationship to, dip to diplomacy on the Korean Peninsula, Dr. Zhao? 
Well, I think at the end of the day, you have to take uh, the concern of the North Koreans into consideration, because uh, the U.S. side only uh, uh, accusing uh, North Korea of developing nuclear weapons or destabilizing the situation. However, they do not provide anything that can satisfy the security concern of the uh, other party. So I think it's very important, and it's also China's suggestion that we need to go with parallel tracks. On the one track, we need to uh, push North Korea to denuclearize and achieve the free uh, nuclear-free peninsula. On the other hand, we need to push forward with the peace treaty, also the recognition of North Korea's legitimacy. So I think it, we need to combine this together to move forward with uh, you know more peaceful uh, regional agenda. So that's why I think the war 70 years ago is very important because if we cannot achieve that, there's always a danger. Uh, hovering around our heads that uh, there might be a war and today it's even more dangerous because we're entering into nuclear age and North Korea's capability is increasing uh, that uh, you know right now could reach the uh, continental USA so I think yeah. there's an urgency for us to come together and solve this problem as soon as possible. And Professor Lee, how do you see the stalemate in Washington Pyongyang relations? Any change in expectations for after the US presidential election in November? I would say no matter whether it's uh, Mr. Biden or Mr. Trump in the White House as of next year, the propensity on the part of the U.S. leader to uh, fall into Kim Jong-un's trap uh, to create, to make history and to launch at another opportunity for a fake deal that will remain strong. No one remembers today virtually, but Bill Clinton came very close to holding a summit meeting with Kim Jong-il in 2000. Clinton sent his Secretary of State to Pyongyang in October 2000 to pave the road for his own visit. And the only reason it didn't happen was not because Clinton changed his mind. Even in January 2001, two weeks before Inauguration Day, and when he would step down, he still had not given up on the idea of visiting Pyongyang. And the reason it didn't happen was the vote recount in the wake of that presidential election between Al Gore and George W. Bush. So whether it's Biden or Trump, if Kim Jong-un, at a time of his own choosing, smiles, perhaps sends his sister to the White House, creates the ambiance for another summit pageantry, I would say, uh, whether it's Biden or Trump, he will probably lunge at that opportunity. And finally, very briefly, Dr. Zhao, uh, what do you see as the key for perhaps securing a breakthrough in the Korean Peninsula? Well, at this point, it's uh, not clear because the U.S. is undergoing a major election. Uh, but after that, I think uh, uh, people will come back to the negotiation table and to uh, take consideration of what I've just said. You know, on the one hand, uh, we need to push forward with denuclearization, but on the other hand, the UN sanctions needs to be relaxed in parallel. So I think I remain hopeful that this uh, issue could move forward, but again, it depends on how the U.S. will treat uh, North Korea and what kind of policies after uh, the election the new administration would adopt. Mm. All right. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your insights. Uh, Dr. Zhao Hai and Professor Sun Yun Li, appreciate your insights. And that'll do it for this edition of Dialogue. Thanks for watching. I'm Wang Mengmeng. Stay tuned for other shows on CGTN.